Three questions for you. Three questions. What if humans were are designed to be always in communion with God, but the fall of man has disrupted that communion? What if, to keep your mental health, you need to talk to someone you can trust? What if you can trust Jesus? Three questions. Sometimes we talk about Bible prophecy. Other times we talk about the moral decline all around us and how, you know, the need we have to exercise the faith muscle. Sometimes we just talk about very old-fashioned stuff. Today, just some very old-fashioned stuff. You know, there's a reason why some things work and some things don't work. Things that are from the kingdom work. Things that are innovations of, of, of humans, mostly those just collapse hard. I want to look with you today at just a few Bible passages help give us some clue and help for this hour. This is a very strange hour, did you notice, in our world today? Unfortunately, strangeness is becoming the norm, and when it's the norm, it's not strange anymore. But I'd say it's pretty strange, the things we're seeing these years. We seem to live near the collapse of one thing and the birth of something new, and sometimes the new things are good and sometimes they're not new. When a new poison oak or a new poison ivy plant comes up, it's, in my opinion, it's not a good thing. And we're living in a time when it would be good to draw closer to God than we've ever been. Now, almost our entire study today will be in three Bible passages, but I want to start with one statement uh, that uh, we're not going to delve into all the different kinds of prayer. Boy, I was tempted, but I, I understood this. I want that the Lord wants this simple. I'm going to try to do that, keep it real simple. But I want to start with one problem, just one thing here, one idea that we sometimes feel that in our own particular case, that it's futile for us to approach God. Don't even try, just give it up, it's hopeless. Have you ever felt that way? Now, one of the best items you could have for mental health in our world today, I personally believe, I've got a lot of books on my shelf. There's a book called The Ministry of Healing. And it's one of the best books for mental health. There's one paragraph, one paragraph, page 181 to 182. I'm just going to start with this, and we'll go to the scriptures, but I wanted to start right away because I don't want you to say, well, this is futile, you know, I'll be out of here in 40 minutes, and, and uh, won't, uh, that won't be any use to me, but I'll wait and I'll leave. I want you to have a benefit from this. I want to have a benefit from this. Here's the statement. I want to nip it right here. Many who have been overcome by temptation are humiliated by their failures, and they feel that it is in vain for them to approach unto God. But this thought is of the enemy's suggestion. When they have sinned and feel that they cannot pray, tell them that it is then the time to pray. Ashamed they may be and deeply humbled, but as they confess their sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive their sins and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. Now it gets better. You say, How could it get better than that? <laughs> Nothing is apparently more helpless yet really more invincible than the 
soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly on the merits of the Savior. Are you encouraged? But it gets better. By prayer, by the study of his word, by faith in his abiding presence, the weakest of human beings may live in contact with the living Christ, and he will hold them by a hand that will never let go. That's pretty encouraging. We should not be ruled by feelings of self-hatred, feelings of reproach. You know, the devils love that, and if it's something the devils love, then it should be something you hate. Just think about a few things here before we, we open our Bible over. You can open it to the Psalms. That's where we're going to start. But I want to think here about some of the things that we just, we just were told. So it says, many who have been overcome by temptation, that would be all of us. Many of us are humiliated by their failures. They feel that it is in vain for them to approach unto God. Now, did you notice what it said next? But this thought is of the enemy's suggestion. When you have that thought, you know the source. The source of that thought, it is of the enemy's suggestion. Now, if you're receiving a thought, any thought at all, if you're receiving any thought that is of the enemy's suggestion, is that a thought you want to have? You could, there's a lot of ways you could get a thought from the enemy's suggestion. He may, he may swoop in and drop it into your brain. The devils can, can do some of that. You don't have to keep it there, but... So that's one way. It could come to you from somebody saying something to you. They could make a suggestion. You could feel badly about it. It could be somebody who's trying to encourage you. Remember Job's three friends? The encouragement was going down instead of up. It could come to you in those ways. There's many ways it could come to you. But if it's a thought of the devil's suggestion, then we don't want it. I'm for sad devils. I'm not for happy devils. I'm for sad devils. So I would avoid any thought that's of the enemy's suggestion. Now it says when you can't, you feel you can't pray, that's time to pray. Nothing is apparently more helpless yet really more invincible. It looks helpless, but it is really more invincible than you and I when we need to pray. Anyway, there's a lot of good pieces here. Finally, maybe mention this. It said here these things, by prayer, by the study of his word, and by faith in his abiding presence. The weakest, the weakest of human beings may live, live in contact with the living Christ. In contact. That's pretty good news. Well, you know what? We can live in contact with him all the time. Sometimes in our house, the internet stops working. And a word will come. Dad, did you turn off the internet? And you know, we can live in contact with Christ. He never turns it off. There's never a glitch or a power outage or something that needs to be reset. We can live in contact with the living Christ. And those things, we're not going to talk a lot today about the study of the word, but prayer and faith in his abiding presence, those I want to touch those today for us. Okay, so if you're discouraged, you feel, you feel like praying doesn't work, doesn't work for me, you're wrong. It works for you. The devil wants, it's of the enemy's suggestion, though, don't bother, don't worry about it, don't pray. Go out and mow the grass, do something. You've got something else to do, but don't pray. So let's not be ruled by feelings of self-hatred and reproach. Uh, the devils love it. When we need prayer most, let us engage with prayer without hesitation. Now, open to Psalm 73. And we're going to start in that place, Psalm 73. You might remember Psalm 73. It's the one, you know, where the writer says he was struggling. When he was struggling, he looked into the sanctuary of God, and then he experienced trust in God. You remember that one? Your way is in the sanctuary. Remember that prayer? 
you follow the psalmist as you read through, we won't, have, won't take the time to read through it all today, but you should. This Sabbath, you have time to read Psalm 73. And there's a lot of interesting business going on in this psalm. If you read through it, you will find as you start at the front and keep working your way through that here's the psalmist. Here he is all bumbling and stumbling, failing. He stands up again. Slowly, he's becoming stronger and more steady and more victorious through Jesus as he goes through his psalm. Then he talks about the wicked. And what does he say about the wicked? Well, he says the wicked talk a lot. They're chattering away. They've got things to say. They're just doing great. They're prospering. They always seem like they've got enough. You're scraping by, but the wicked, they're just, they've got a new car in the driveway. They've got everything they need. New bag of chips. They don't know God. They don't have the peace of God. They seem to have enough, but their prosperity is an illusion. It is fake. It is a mirage. They are not prospering. Imagine living day by day by day, and you've got all, the, you've got all your stuff, but you don't have salvation. You don't have God. You don't have someone you can talk to who you can trust. Do you have mental health then? If most people are stepping back from God, if they're stepping away from belief in, in the God of Scripture, the personal God. And if we need to talk to someone we can trust to have true mental health, isn't it? Do you understand that the people all around us may be having a mental health deficit? That helps explain a few things in our world. So the psalmist, he's struggling, and he talks about the wicked now, and they're not prospering. But, you know, he says, he says they're, in, they're actually they're enemies of God, and their end will be extreme and ungood. But in verse 17, Psalm 73, verse 17, then he goes into the sanctuary of God, and then he says, ah, he says, then I understood their end. You see, friends, today is the day to be right with God. It takes time to shape character. All of us are shaping our own character, and we're being shaped. You know, the company you keep is a very important piece of who you are. So you should keep really good company. And you know what? The best company you can keep is the God of heaven and earth. His character is the right influence upon you. In verse 17, he goes into the sanctuary of God. He understands their end. We need God's help to be shaped right. Left to ourselves, you know, we're just going to be stick men, stick figures. But when we, if we are in communion with, communion with God, we can be human people. We need the companionship of God. We need his friendship to become what we can become. We will always, he will always receive us with mercy. How many people can you say that about? Don't you like it when you know somebody and you're, you're, in, you're in trouble, you have a problem, you're sad or depressed, you've got some issue going on, but you know you can always talk to pers this person because that person, 100% of the time, they receive me with interest, they pay attention, they receive me with curiosity, and they're in, they engage. But you know that God is the one who always receives you with interest and energy. God is always that way. You know, we have a lot of pets today. We have cats and dogs and poodles. And some people have a bird. Somebody has a turtle. Well, turtles are pretty neat. But if you talk to your turtle, I don't think it's going to have the same effect as talking to God, to Jesus, to talking to God Jesus died on the cross for you. Jesus experienced suffering like you and I. He's able to be our sympathetic high priest. So talking to God is not the same as talking to your poodle. Let's say a poodle may have the intelligence of a, what, a five or six-year-old child. That's, that's pretty awesome. But I, I think talking to Jesus is the way to go. We can always approach God. There's never a time. When you can't approach him. 
He will always receive us with mercy. He will always encourage moderation and self-control on our part. When we're egged onward by a predatory, consumer-oriented environment that's always saying what? Buy now, pay later. Be careful. Because we know that the borrower is servant to the lender. And the day to be right with God is always today. Now look with me at verses 23 and 24. Psalm 73, verse 23 and 24. And admittedly, we've sort of described some of the psalm, which we're kind of leaping in here without a full study. But still, look at these verses. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. You see, friends, we can be with God continually. No interruptions. And we have to keep coming back. So you start your day with him. At some point, you know what? You realize you've lost focus. Isn't it true? You have in some measure left his company, and so you, you return praying. And so we continue to grow heavenward. Notice that God guides us as believers. He counsels us. See, the suggestion here is that we actually seek his counsel. We actually follow his counsel. You know what a lot of people want? They seem to want a Christianity where, you know, we do whatever we want, whenever we want. Isn't that what people want? Jesus never set us that pattern. Give me a, show me in the Bible that pattern. You won't find it. We seek our Father's will. We do as he leads in God's. See, God is our ruler, and we are responsible to him. And you know what? Let's be honest. We're all fix-it-up projects, aren't we? By the time God gets to us, that's, we're a fix-up project. And some of us are pretty much 100% a fix-up project. There's not a lot. But God, but God will work. He's going to do carpenter work. And he can prepare us for his things if we, we put our trust in him. And then we're going to reap endless rewards. So he says, I... The psalmist says, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me. So the implicit thing is here, not only just I'm going to say, hey, God, here I am. These are the things I want. No, it is also when you pray, you're receiving counsel from him so that he guides you and you realize there are some things that would be best for you to do. Afterward, what? After receiving his counsel, after being guided by his counsel, he says, afterward, you will receive me to glory. We want the glory now. We want the chips now. We want this. Afterward, he will receive me to glory. Let's turn to another passage. Let's go over to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. We can look into our second passage. And when we're done here, I'm going to give you a list of nine things. Nine things that might help you to make God your prayer partner. That they'll be all derived from pretty much these things we've just been talking about. So let's go over to 1 Thessalonians. Here we go. And go over to chapter 5. Now there's a spot right in the middle here, and you know, when you hear it, you'll say, yeah, I know where he, why he picked it. But let's look at verses 14 to 22. Let's, let's, let's get a little more context here. So, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 14 to 22. I'll read it all. Here we come. And now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain 
from every form of evil. By the way, that's an interesting passage. Did you notice all these flat, full-blown statements? Everything, all, everything, everything's included. Did you notice it? This, this is a black and white thinker here. I mean, uh, this, is, this is fundamentalism or something, right? There's a problem here. Well, listen to it again. Listen to these absolute stark statements. They, they tell you everything. You must do everything. You cannot do this at all. You do all of this, right? And now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. Now, some of us are, some of us have been, can be patient with some people. Yeah? But to be patient with all, what about that? And I'm preaching to myself too, and you, you know it. See that no one, there's a, there, that's, there it is, no one, no, no, nobody do this. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. What a fundamentalist. What a bad guy. He's not giving me any space. I've got to do the right thing all the time. Only it's good to do the right thing all the time. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue, not most of the time, not part of the time, 50%, 51%. Always pursue what is good. And this is an interesting element, both for yourselves and for all. Always do what's good for you, truly good, morally good, you know, ethically good, and for all. So you can't just do good to you and leave other people out. Isn't that interesting? But he's not done yet. Rejoice always. Honestly, there are times when I haven't rejoiced. Yeah. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. We've all heard a sermon about pray without ceasing, right? I never really saw myself as a giant prayer person, you know. People have this thing that they're known for, that thing, or whatever. But, you know, and I, I'm, I'm not claiming to be, but I'll tell you this, I began to realize more recently I am really praying a lot of the time. I'm writing an article or a sermon or, or I'm driving I'm behind the wheel a lot, going here and there. And it just seems, I just really, I never thought about it a lot, but how many times is my, I'm, my, I'm talking to God? Talking to God. And, 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 and praise the Lord, I'm growing in this. Pray without ceasing. And you know, if this is important for our mental health, then it's probably pretty good to be praying without ceasing because for good mental health, yeah, I probably should be doing more of that, right? Anyway, I'm in the middle. Let's keep on, right? Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. We give thanks once in a while. In everything give thanks. Well, but I give thanks once in a while. But in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for who? So it's part of God's plan for me to give thanks. And I haven't done very much of it. And when I ref choose not to give thanks, it's kind of like a choice. I should be seeking it. I should be looking for things to be thankful for. And we will grow in our walk with Jesus if we give more thanks to God than we have been giving. Then he goes on and says, do not quench the spirit. And you know, we're Christian people. We're connected to the Lord Jesus, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who died on the cross for us. He sends us the gift of his Holy Spirit. Shouldn't it be true that on some occasions, no, maybe not every hour, not every day, not every week, but wouldn't it be true then that there would be some occasions in our experience when we would have a, a unique, Time, a connection with the Holy Spirit that was marked 
that you would, you would know you've been with God. You would know that God is in this house. You would know that you've been with the Holy Spirit. Shouldn't there be times like that? Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Not most things. Test all things. Test what the government says. Test what the doctor says. Test what the pastor says. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from some of the evil forms. So, yes, abstain from every form of evil. It's kind of some pretty strong stuff in there. But back up, rewind a little bit, because one of those pieces in all those emphatic, absolute statements was what? For today's topic, pray without ceasing. See, praying makes God your prayer partner. Simple, old-fashioned, heart-to-heart prayer. God's listening. You know, I was online today with checking something with the uh, uh, air. I just flew back, and I checked with something with the airline, and this little thing popped up on the screen and said, your waiting time is about one minute. That's pretty good, isn't it? One minute. Wouldn't it be neat if when you send a prayer up to God, you know, you got a little message back, pops up on, in a, you only have to wait one minute, and God will be with you. But friends, we know we don't have to wait one minute. Instantly, he's with us. Instantly. And here's another thought. Our prayers should not always be about us. Now, a lot of our prayers can be about us. That's not wrong. That's not evil. You're you. You've got things to pray about. You should pray about some of your things. We should pray a lot about us. But we should also give, give many more thanks to him in prayer that we do. And our prayers shouldn't just be about us. We've got so much to be thankful for. Now, who do we have to be thankful to? Who are you thankful to? We're thankful, you know, for things each other we do, but ultimately, right, we should be thankful to God. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, that you be thankful. And what, how much did that apply to? Where was that there? Oh, there it is. In everything, give thanks. Now, thanking him in prayer, that is a great deal for us to help us. A spirit of thankfulness helps us. Now, by the way, notice there's only two kinds of spirit here, right? You either have a spirit of thankfulness or you don't have a spirit of thankfulness. Am I right? Is there like a halfway thankfulness? I haven't bumped into that yet. So either you have a spirit of thankfulness or you have a spirit of unthankfulness. Now, wouldn't it be honest? Don't raise your hand, but wouldn't it be honest? Isn't it true that most of your life and most of my life, I wouldn't, I've probably been a person, since I didn't have a spirit of thankfulness so much, that only leaves one other thing, right? That means I had a spirit of unthankfulness most of the time. Isn't, isn't this true? I don't want it to be true, but isn't it true? So we have those options. We can have a spirit of thankfulness and it be in prayerful and thanking God for this, thanking him for all these things. Or we can just say, yeah, Jesus died on the cross for me. I wonder what's for dinner. See, we need a spirit of thankfulness, and that will help our mental health. If we make God our prayer partner, part of the time will be spent recognizing that he has done good for us and thanking him for that good. Thank you, Lord. We are loved by God. That should mean something to us. You know, we want to be loved by our, our partner, by our children. 
You want to be loved by your relatives. You want your neighbors to, to appreciate you. And then when it comes to God, somehow it doesn't matter. Like the fact that the God of the universe who made you, who, who knew you in the womb before you were formed and wanted you to be part of his universe, that the fact that that God loves you, that should mean something to you, to me. We are loved by God. We haven't given thanks and prayer as we might have. And in fact, let me just challenge you right now. Think of three things that you're thankful for today. Three things that you're thankful for. Can you think of three things that you're thankful for right off the top of your head? And you don't have to stop at three. But I'll bet you if you stop and turn the crank a couple of times, you'll realize there's a lot of things you're very, you should be very thankful for. You can thank God for those. Thank you, God. On the Sabbath of all days, wouldn't it be good if, if, uh, if, if the report came in, you know, that maybe there's a reporting angel. And he comes in and he says, God, we had this many prayers coming in today. And, you know, we noticed that on the seventh day, on, the Lord, on your day, on the Sabbath day, we have 89% more prayers of thankfulness coming up. That would be an interesting report to have. I mean, they should be coming on every day. But I'd, I would like it if, if it was noteworthy that God's people were thanking him. Another item here was what? Don't quench the spirit. When God is your prayer partner, when you are in continual connection with him, there can be times of special blessing. We talked about that. And I think there's kind of like a roster, you know, kind of like an on and off list. Like when you go to work, you know, you clock in. I think we should all be clocked in. Christians should all be clocked in. If we're available to God, if we're alive and awake and breathing, and we're asking for divine appointments, then don't you think, don't you think that God's going to give you some of those divine appointments? But maybe one reason why we quench the spirit is because we are not available to him. We're not clocked in. And so he wants to do something. He wants to do something for us, but we're in uh, human la-la land, and so we don't, we don't notice it. And so the opportunity comes, and then the opportunity goes by, and it's over, and it's gone. It's gone forever. Choked out. So we need to be, to be on God's active team. When we're on his active team, we will have supernatural seasons given by his spirit. And again, not necessarily every day. Seasons where God worked through us. So I hope that you're checked in. Let's go over to one last passage. Let's go over to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5. Keeping it simple, straightforward, old-fashioned. I just preached at this camp meeting, and I walked out, took a walk. I walked out by the road, and they had a little sign up there that said, Old-fashioned camp meeting. And I thought, wow, that's pretty neat that I get to preach at an old-fashioned camp meeting. not enough technology. No, we were blessed anyway. The Lord was good to us. Hebrews 5, verses 7 to 9. One last passage today. Now, let me tell you, look at verses 5 and 7 and tell me who this is about, because you won't believe me. This is about Jesus, okay? Listen, here it comes. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now notice again, look at verse 5 and verse 7, just to make sure we're all on the same page here. Am I wrong? This is talking about Jesus. Okay, 
now that we're going to look at it, you're going to say, no, that couldn't possibly be talking about Jesus. Well, let's look at it. So in the days of his flesh, that is, you know, in those days when Jesus came to live as a man among men, it's talking about Jesus, Jesus offered up prayers to his Father. Now, by the way, did you notice that they were offered up? What's an offering? Offering is when you give something. We return our tithe because it's already God's. But we give an offering. Right? Those are two different things. One is what we owe, and one is to stem from our cheerfulness, our gladness. Well, and not that you can't tithe out of gladness, but he already owns that. Jesus, it says, did what? Jesus offered up prayers. And when you pray, you know, silver and gold have I none. There's a lot of things we don't have. But I'll tell you what we can do. One thing we can do is we can offer God prayer. It is an offering. It is a, something we are giving back to him. It's a form of worship. When you pray, you're entering into worship. When you're driving in the street and you're in your car and you send up a little prayer, you are worshiping God. It is an offering. Prayer is an offering. When you say a little prayer before a meal, thanking God for the food, that is a worshipful offering. I mean, unless your heart's not in it. If your heart's not in it, it's nothing. So Jesus offered up prayers. He gave worship to his Father. Every time you pray, you are offering up worshipfulness. What else did he do? When he had offered up prayers and supplications. And it goes on to say, with vehement tears and cries, is it okay to be intense when you pray? Is, pray, is, is crying allowed? Did Jesus sometimes cry when he prayed, apparently? When was the last time you cried when you prayed? It says here that he offered up prayers to his father. And then it says this amazing thing. You have to go back and look again to make sure we're talking about Jesus. He was heard because of his godly fear. Jesus was heard because of his godly fear. Wait a minute. That's what he says. Now, love is not perfected in fear. There is a fear that's the wrong, but there's also a good kind of fear, right? There's a respectful kind of fear, a reverent kind of fear. And it says, he was heard because of his godly fear. We all know Jesus prayed continually, but have we ever thought about him God himself praying to his father in godly fear. But that's what the inspired writer says. But I'm not saying we have to suddenly become formal. You can pray with these and thous. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. But this isn't talking about formality. It's just talking about approaching God as he is God, I am not. He is the creator, I am the creature. He has everything. He is love. He is good. He is the essence of all good. Then there's me. Who is it? And we can approach God, and we should approach him, and our prayers should come to him. I believe if Jesus did it, and Jesus is our example, our prayers should come to him uh, with godly fear. When the angels are in God's presence, what do they do? They take their wings and they cover their feet. They cover their angel feet. They cover their angel face and head in God's presence. And we show up, hey, God, how are you doing? It'll be better for us to approach him in godly fear. Not fear, but in godly fear. Now, it says here, his his sacrifice was accepted. He learned obedience by the things he experienced. His, his actual obedience became our example. 
And now it says he's the author of salvation to all who obey him. Mark it, not everyone who names Jesus will be saved, but, but all who obey him. And what do we see when we studied in uh, Psalm 73, verse 23 and 24 at the beginning? That he counsels with us. He has something for us. When we pray to him, there's kind of a built-in expectation that we're seeking his guidance and we're going to work, we're going to follow his guidance. How do we know how to obey him? By being in the word every day. Surely you have time to be in the Bible every day. But, but we, we have time for two meals or three meals, or maybe snacking between meals, which I'm not advocating, because Paula will come after me, as she should. But if we have time to eat day by day, physical food, are not we, isn't that not important, even more important to have spiritual food? Because man is, after all, a spiritual being. God designed me to be a spiritual being. A person can have a, can have a full belly but an empty heart. And it's much better to have communion with the Holy Spirit and an empty stomach rather than the other way around. And a lot of people in our world are walking through this world and they haven't eaten you know, you talk about homeless people, people maybe who don't have any food to eat, and we're really worried to get a piece of food to them, and that's, that's good. But how many people around us are spiritually hungry and haven't eaten for, for months? Now it says here, who in the days of his flesh, verse 7, when he had offered up prayers and supplications. Now there's two different things here. Now there's, there's many varieties and pieces to prayer, but I, I'm not doing that today. Keeping it simple. But there's two different Bible words. You don't need to remember these in the Greek where it says prayers. He, Jesus, this is Jesus, our example. He offered up prayers, the aces, that's one word, and a different word, supplications. Ikateria, two different words. Like I say, you don't need to remember that. But the first word means to ask more generally with need, like you're seeking for something. The second word, supplication, more particularly means approaching to ask for a favor. Now those are two kind of different things. There's two different kinds of arguments here. Lord, I have need of this. And then the other argument is, Lord, please give me this. Well, those are the same thing. No, they're not. No, they're not. And we should be straightforward in our conversations with God. There's no fooling him, but you know, how is it? How many times we pray and and you pray, and you say, God, I need this. And then we go through a long list of reasons why we need it. Like, God didn't think about or God's going, wow, I never thought of that. But you know what? A lot of times when we're doing that, when we're giving those reasons, you know what we're doing? You know what you're doing? You're not really trying to convince God that you need that. You know where I'm going, right? You're trying to convince you that you need it. In other words, when you come to God, your whole thing is already bent. You're trying to convince yourself you need it, and you hope that maybe God will give it. So there's something kind of skewed in you. And yet the God who can answer your prayer with all power, you're gonna, he's going to trust you. He's going to answer with all power, answer your prayer. When you're, when you're, when you're not, when your heart isn't right, I saw a little clip of something here this week. I can't remember. It was a um, judge. They were interviewing people. They wanted to be seated for jury duty, and all these people didn't want to be seated for jury duty. So they were all giving their excuses, right? Uh, I can't do this because I'm a bigot. I can't do this because of this reason. I can't do this because of this reason. And he kept saying, okay, never mind. Sit down. And they kept staying. And finally, a guy stood up at the end, and he said, um, he says, I'd like to get out of jury duty. Why? Why? Well, I'm just, I just don't want to do it. Now, that doesn't really commend the guy because it's kind of like a societal duty. You probably should. But anyway, the judge said, dismissed. Go away. Go on. But the people that were all making excuses and stirring up stories and fun funky little stories to persuade the judge, you know, they were all lying to him through their teeth and telling him why they couldn't do it. Those people all stayed. And the guy that was honest, to leave 
interesting little clip here. When you think about this, so here we have the kind of prayer where we're, we need, have needs and we're seeking for something, and we have another kind of prayer where we want it. We think it would be good to have it, and we ask for it. We're asking a favor. And if you want to have your prayers answered, don't waste your time trying to persuade yourself or to persuade God that you need something. He knows if you need it or don't need it. So just be honest with him. Be honest with God and it'll work out. Be dishonest with God and see how that goes. And the devils will take when our prayer then isn't answered and they'll try to help us because us to be bitter. Bitter and unhappy with God. God didn't answer my prayer. Well, yeah, maybe your heart wasn't in the right place. Maybe if he'd have answered your prayer, it would have done you more harm than if he didn't answer your prayer. Two or three quick thoughts here now at the end, right? As the man prayed, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, we can pray. Lord, I want to avoid all self-deception. Lord, please help my self-deception. Because that's one thing we're all pretty good at, deceiving me. Distractions. How many times have you sat down with the intention to be in prayer, but your phone distracted you? They shouldn't call them smartphones. They should call them distraction phones. And there's other distractions. Seek the kingdom. Be intentional about making God our prayer partner. You know, they say there's more loneliness in our world than ever. Here's another just simple thing, right? People are lonely, lonely down to their toes. And they're never going to hear it from the mainstream news. They're never going to hear, well, have you prayed to God about this? But you and I, all of us can do it. All of us can say to this somebody when they, they're unloading all their just frustration and grumpy and sad and it just sounds like, you know, yikes, it's just there's no reason to live. Hey, you could say to anybody, by your own experience, you can say, you know, have you considered maybe praying to God about this? And don't, don't say it like, you know, have you prayed to God about this? Don't do it that way. It's not scolding. Scolding won't, won't help anybody. But because praying has helped you, you can share it with somebody else. This is something that might help them. Prayer is kind of a universal, right? It's not like, well, yeah, you're, take your Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist ideas away. Everybody wants, maybe, that knows Christianity would pray. So this isn't, isn't distinct to us. There's no greater cure for loneliness than prayer to the Creator God who knew you before he formed you in the womb. Prayer. Simple, straightforward. You'll never see somebody from the UN, probably, who will ever suggest to you that you pray. But you don't have to go to the United Nations or the World Health Organization for prayer. You need to go to the God of heaven, and he has helps for us. Old-fashioned, basic tool, prayer. There's, you have it. You don't have to buy a gadget. You don't have to buy a book. If you want the, the best instruction about prayer, there it is. So here's nine things, real quick then here, just to sum up. Nine things that might help us uh, see what you think. Number one, we should pray continuously throughout the day, talking with God silently, internally as we have needs and thoughts, and as we're seeking spiritual insight. Every day. Number two, especially when we have become discouraged by spiritual failures, we should turn again and pray. Number three, as we seek to have Jesus make us better people, one reason for continuous prayer is because we want his company, his presence, to shape our character, the company you keep. So keep the best company, the one that was nailed to the cross for you. Number four, prayer is a means by which we receive and enact his guidance and counsel. It's not just reading the Bible. Number five, prayers of thanksgiving help us get outside of ourselves and they humanize us. 
prayer for others grows us in other love. It's hard to dislike somebody you're continually praying for. If you have a neighbor that sort of grates on you, start praying for them. They may still grate a little bit, but I think it'll go down easier. Number six, if prayer was an essential part of the practice of Jesus, who is our example, how much more should our lives include prayer? Number seven, some of our prayers about what we need, we often mistake wants for needs. Some of our prayers are requests for things we want. We should keep those two things distinct and honestly tell God about what we're requesting. Number eight, distractions are a great hindrance to prayer. Open up spaces in your day where there are minimal distractions. Harder to do these days. But then again, no. So remember, nobody in here has a smartphone. You all have distraction phones. They will never be marketed that way. Number nine, prayer is a practice common to all Christians and is a practice we can share with others to encourage them and help defeat loneliness. really new today, but one of the most important tools you have is your Swiss Army knife, your pliers, prayer, secret weapon, and much too secret.